Do you pray with me? Father, we do just thank you for this time uh, to gather. We thank you for the opportunity just to enter into worship together as a community, to come as a collective body, um, to be met by you, um, to, to give back to you just a, a small portion of the praise and glory that's worth your name. Lord, receive that. Meet us in this place this morning as we open up your word, Holy Spirit, speak, that we might better understand you, that we might be transformed by you, and that we may live out the vision that you have given us as your church. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 700 years prior to the arrival of Jesus, there was a prophet in Jerusalem by the name of Isaiah. Uh, The northern kingdom at this point in time in Israel's history, Israel was split into two separate kingdoms in the The northern kingdom, uh, when Isaiah was writing, either had been or was about to be um, taken into captivity by by the Assyrians. Uh, Isaiah lived in the southern kingdom, and as he is writing to the the leaders and and the, the king of Israel, he is looking at what's unfolding, and he's saying, that this fate that had befallen the northern kingdom, this is what waits for you if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't return to the uh, commands that Yahweh had given you as, as his people. And as, as, I re- as Isaiah writes this, this, really these words of, of judgment over Judah, the, the southern kingdom, he, he always weaves in this thread of uh, hope, this sense that, that despite this impending judgment, if there isn't repentance, a, a judgment that they see around them, that this does not mark the end of the promise. This promise that, that Yahweh had spoken to his people, it has not yet been fully realized. And as Isaiah describes this hope to the people, he talks about it as a a great light breaking into the darkness. In fact, listen to this. This is at the very end of Isaiah chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. The prophet writes this. It says, they will wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward, they'll curse their king and their God. They'll look towards the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction. And they will be driven into thick darkness. So this, it's not sounding great. And then verse, uh, chapter nine, verse one, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of Nephtali, or the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Nephtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to land east of the Jordan, to the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. For 700 years, the the people existed in this state of, of that Isaiah describes as darkness of fear and anxiety, and I would venture to guess for most of us, it doesn't take too much of uh, of a mental exercise to kind of wrap our heads around the fear and the chaos that darkness often produces in our lives, even just physically. When I was a child, I used to attend a camp up in northern Ohio called Stony Glen Camp. I was probably late elementary, early middle school at the time, and And on one particular night, I had stayed back after kind of campfire time. I was talking with one of the counselors or they praying with me something. I can't remember the details. But after that time, I started to make my way back to my cabin. And like a lot of camps, the cabins were kind of set back into the woods. And I hadn't brought a flashlight with me. I hadn't prepared for the fact that I was going to be making my way back to camp, uh, to my cabin uh, on my own. And so I I thought I knew the way and I started down the path and pretty quickly I realized like I was getting disoriented and, and kind of getting um, scared, to be honest. 
and I'm, I'm finally kind of when I'm beginning to get desperate, I, I see the outline of my cabin and I think to myself, I finally made it. And I get to my cabin, it's pitch black, everybody had gone to bed for the night. This was back in a day when apparently counselors did not need to make sure every kid was back in their cabin when they turned off the lights. And, and I, I, my bunk is kind of by the door there, so I walk in and I, I start to climb up into my bunk. And as I'm climbing up into my bunk, I realize someone else is already there. And at first I think, who's sleeping in my bunk? And then I think, I'm not in the right cabin right now. And I, I quickly like scatter out of there. The next day, it was like this whole cabin was like, there was murmurs going on. People are like, thought they were about to be pranked, all this different stuff. And I just played it like totally innocent. Like, yeah, that's, that's crazy, right? But we all know the experience in the sense to which the darkness disorients us, which it, it creates chaos and fear. Due to the rebellion and, and sin of God's people, specifically those that had been called to lead the people of God, to care for them, who had the responsibility of, of um, leading them in obedience to Yahweh, for 700 years the people lived in this state of spiritual darkness. And yet the promise remains that that light would break into the darkness. Now fast forward to the time when John is writing his gospel. And if you remember this, we, we looked at this during our Advent season, but when John introduces his gospel, when he introduces the Logos, the one who came into the world, he describes him in John chapter one as, as the light. It says, in him, verse four, was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness has not overcome it. Then verse 9 of that same chapter, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This thread of hope, the promise of light breaking into the darkness. John captures it as he's introducing his audience to who Jesus is. Last week, we, we began uh, a new preaching series entitled uh, Unrecognized King." And if you were here with us last week, you, you realize or you heard us describe how our intent, our desire in this series is, uh, is that we would encounter the real Jesus. Right? Jesus in his own words, not, not the Jesus of our making that, that vaguely resembles the Jesus of Scripture, but also vaguely resembles us and resembles our preferences and our agendas and our opinions. As the Apostle John tells the story of Jesus, he, throughout his gospel, he shares these stories and these experiences where God acts in miraculous ways. John refers to them as, as signs. They're pointing to who he is and to what he's doing. And oftentimes these these signs, these miracles are followed up by statements from Jesus himself where he reveals who he is by taking a description or an experience, an event in the Old Testament where Yahweh met the people of God and then he applies it to himself. These are oftentimes referred to in, in John's gospel as the, the I am statements of Jesus. Jesus says things like, I am the bread of life that we looked at last week from, from John chapter 6. And here in, in John chapter 8, and then what we're going to look at in John chapter 9, Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world, this intentional echo to the promise that Isaiah had given the people. As you might imagine, when you say something like that, there are a variety of reactions that result. And we're going to see that again in the text. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me to to John chapter nine. And we're gonna work our way through the majority of, of this chapter where Jesus, again, describes himself as the light of the world and in describing himself as the light of the world, he is really confronting uh, two types of blindness. And, and that's what I wanna look at today, beginning with the confrontation of a physical blindness. Confronting physical blindness, John nine, beginning in verse one now. It says, as he was passing by, referring to Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. 
His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Which by the way, just, just for a point of reference, that this pool was um, discovered and archeologically discovered in 2004. So just re, you know, in the last 20 years, they discovered the location of this pool. So he left, washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said he is the one. Others were saying, no, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, he answered. There's a question at the outset of this text that I, I think we ask ourselves in a number of ways and experiences in life. If you are above the age of probably, I don't know, 45 or so, you can remember a season, a time in your life where driving one place to another was not guided by a GPS system or a phone. And so um, if you were had to find some place, like for instance, myself, I'm, I'm horribly, I'm directionally challenged. And so as a high school student, when I wanted to get to different places, friends' houses, that sort of thing, I literally would bring my little brother with me because he's just a human atlas, you know? And I was like, well, you get to hang out with the juniors and seniors because I can't get there on my own kind of thing. And when I was a college student, uh, I, I was a college student in Chicago. Sherry, my wife's family, lived in Bartlett. We were dating at the time, and we'd go back and forth, but I always had her in the car. And the first time I tried to make that drive on my own, I got hopelessly lost to the point where, and if, if, again, if you're old enough to remember this, what you did was you would just kind of make your way from gas station to gas station, go in, ask the person who's working behind the desk how to get to kind of the general location that you're trying to get to. And I remember in that experience, and if you are old enough to remember this, that place where you find yourself hopelessly lost, asking yourself the question, how did I get here? How did I find myself here? And this is the question essentially that the disciples are asking of Jesus when they see this person. It's the, the, the result of the experience of seeing his suffering and asking the question, how did he end up here? It's a question the disciples ask of Jesus as they see a man who's been physically unable to see from the time he was born. How did he find himself in this place? Right, is it a result of his sin? Was it his parents? The suffering that this man has experienced his entire life must be the result of some type of disobedience, either his own or, or those who went before him. Notice the assumption that lies behind the question here. If there is suffering, if there's pain, if, there, uh, if you're standing face to face with brokenness, if your circumstances are bad, then there must be something that you have done to deserve it. Reminiscent of Job's friends who are sitting with him in the midst of his pain and suffering and looking at him and saying, what did you do, Job? What did you do? There's a type of comfort in thinking this way, particularly when we're trying to make sense of someone else's suffering, because if it's the result of some choice they made, then it gives us this illusion of control. And let's be honest with ourselves. We like to be in control. 
But don't be mistaken, it, it is an illusion and Jesus confronts it. And that's not to say that we don't experience suffering as the result of our own choices, the consequence of our own sin. I, if we were honest with ourselves for more than two seconds, we would acknowledge that. And it's not to say that we don't experience suffering because of the sin of others. Scroll through your headlines on your phone. You'll see that story repeated over and over again all over our world. But when Jesus is confronted with the overall question of suffering, right, he does not center it on, on this man or even on his parents. Timothy Keller, when he was uh, preaching on this text, he, he talked about three specific problems that result when we view suffering this way. He said, first is that when we view suffering as the result of somebody's actions or choices exclusively, he says self-righteousness is, is kind of the inevitable result. Because when I'm not suffering, the, the conclusion must be I've really, I've really impressed God with my righteousness, right? Secondly, he said, it's just incredibly cruel to those in the midst of their suffering, which is of course true in, in this man's experience. And then thirdly, and this is what Jesus points out, he says it's just not true to the facts. It's not true to the facts. Look again at how Jesus responds to his disciples here. Picking it up in verse three, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it's day. So again, Jesus is drawing on this night and day contrast. Night is coming when no one can work. But as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus' answer to the disciples' question is, I, it's not, I'm not here confronting specifically this person's sin or even his parents' sin, although he does that. He accounts for that. He's confronting sin and brokenness as a whole. He's confronting the condition that sin has left humanity in since the time it entered the story all the way back in Genesis chapter three. And the consequences that that has reaped of, of relational brokenness, of human suffering in all forms and ways. And here in, in the life of an individual man that Society walks by every day without noticing. Jesus is going to continue to reveal who he is and why he's here. There's this, this conflict that exists between the blindness, the darkness, and who Jesus is. Those metaphors of, of darkness are blind for us. Those get repeated throughout scripture to de depict and convey the condition that sin has left us in, the result of sin. To which Jesus answers, I am the light of the world. To quote Isaiah, a light has dawned on those living in a land of darkness. Just as, as Jesus' declaration last week that he is the bread of life connected him to the, the redemptive and restorative uh, purposes of, of Passover and of manna that was provided in the desert, his statement here to his disciples that he is the light of the world drew an immediate connection to, to creation, to Genesis chapter one. When the earth, it says in Genesis one, when it was formless and empty and darkness covered the surface of the waters and into that God and, and, and his voice spoke these words, let there be light. Light breaking into the darkness. As Yahweh begins to speak into being the very place where he is going to set humanity to dwell in an uninhibited and imperfect relationship with him. Whereas we read Genesis 1 and, and, and 2, we discover it's the very thing that we were created for. Notice the way that Jesus heals this man here. Look again at verse 6. It says, after he said these things, he spit on the ground made some mud from the saliva, and he spread the mud on his eyes. Like when, again, does this, when was the last time we saw God get into the mud? Right? He's forming humanity when he forms 
male and female, and he shapes him, and he takes him from the ground. Jesus is again, he's making this intentional echo here to the Genesis narrative. When God forms humanity out of the ground, Jesus is revealing himself to be the hope that Isaiah spoke to the people hundreds of years before. To to look for the Messiah who, again, Isaiah would say multiple times in his prophecies that he will open the eyes of the blind, that he is the God of creation who is not only encountering the effects of of brokenness, but he is coming to to defeat them. He's coming not only to encounter the effects of sin, but he's coming to atone for them, to restore us back to the very thing that we were created for and that had been lost in the rebellion. The God of creation is breaking into the the darkness to illuminate what sin has done and to illuminate in me my own need for him to illuminate that in us. Jesus meets this man in the point of a physical need in order to reveal what he is there to do spiritually, which brings us then to this second and I think far more dangerous blindness and that is is spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness. Back in John's gospel now, verse 13, the story continues. It says, they brought the man who, was used, who used to be blind to the Pharisees. And now just a quick bit of, of note here. Um, earlier in John chapter eight, we won't go there today, but the tension between the Pharisees and Jesus has been escalating. In fact, there's a whole conversation in John 8 where Jesus talking about being sent from the father and they say, well, our father's Abraham. And Jesus says, well, actually, you're doing the work of your father, the devil, right? So they didn't, that didn't get received well. And so things are, things are continuing to intensify as it comes between the tension from, from Jesus and the Pharisees. And this is going to only perpetuate this further. It says that the day that Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked him again how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. He told them I wash and I can and I can see. Some of the Pharisees said this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. The Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked him, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? How then does he now see? We know this is our son and that he was born blind. His parents answered, but we, do know, but we don't know how he sees and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents were saying these things because they were afraid of the Jews since the Jews had already agreed that if someone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why the parents said he is of age ask him. So the the blind man is brought in front of the Pharisees to be interrogated about how this happened. And then when they find that unsatisfactory or to confirm his story, they bring in his parents. I don't know if you've ever experienced something where, where you have something right in front of you and yet you fail to see it. One Christmas, my mom and dad had bought for me a 10 speed bike. And oftentimes when, when they were giving us kind of a larger gift, instead of trying to wrap that up or they would kind of hide it somewhere in the house. And after my older brother had opened up a gift, my dad said, I want you to go to the front room and I want you to get batteries. I have batteries in there that he can use in, in his gift, which I found odd, but I, I went in there. I looked around the room, I came back and I said, I didn't see any batteries. And with a look of sort of bewilderment on his face, he said, go look again. And I went back in there, and this time, in the center of the room, I I walked around it, 
was a 10 speed bike with a bow on it that I had completely missed the first time I was in there because I was looking for something else because I didn't see it here. Jesus is confronting this condition among the Pharisees and among us of spiritual blindness. Jesus is right in front of them. The signs are unfolding and they don't see it. And there's a lot that is happening in this text and a lot of ways that we could approach this. But for our time here today, I, I wanna just, I wanna pay attention to or consider some of the indications that reveal spiritual blindness. Indications of spiritual blindness. First, I think one of the indications that's evidence here is this inability to see a human being as a human being. And, and I'm gonna... I'm not gonna go too far into this. I don't wanna make too much of this, but there is this complete inability of the Pharisees to see a man who has spent his entire life living in darkness, now restored to full sight. There's, there's, they're hearing the eyewitness testimony. His parents are in front of them and yet they fail to acknowledge the gift that he's received. They, they, they fail to acknowledge this healing that has been done, and it's an indication of spiritual blindness. It's an indication that our hearts are blind when we have the inability, and again, absent of having all your questions answered about who Jesus is and how he works and how he operates, one of the things that indicates that we are operating out of a position of spiritual blindness is when we fail to see a human being as another human being. In fact, this, this is gonna escalate. We won't, we won't get all the, where, uh, all the way there today, but as this interrogation continues at the point of time of, of frustration at the end of it, they just look at this man and say, you have been uh, born, your entire life is, is born in sin. It's the only way they can explain this. The Pharisees at no point see his humanness. They don't celebrate his healing, but rather they look to accuse him. Secondly, I think an indication of, of spiritual blindness is the inability to see grace instead of, of self-righteousness. To see grace instead of self-righteousness. When we're operating out of a place of, of, of self-righteousness, grace, someone else's experience of grace will offend us. The crux of their accusation against Jesus is that Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath which they contend violated not, not the Mosaic law per se, but really their kind of religious tradition that they had placed around the law, the structure that, that they had built. So much so to the point that they had forgotten why God had given the Sabbath to humanity in the first place, right? To, to be a place for worship, to be a place for restoration, for healing, and for rest. This is not a violation of the Sabbath, but it's an experience of it, and they're missing it because grace is offending their self-righteousness, and it's revealing their spiritual blindness. And then thirdly, I think, one of the indicators of spiritual blindness is when we fail to see our own need. When, when there's an inability to see our own need, the clearest indication that we are operating out of a place of spiritual blindness is when we believe that we see and that we're all good. That, that, that we are okay. The contrast and response between the man who was born blind and the way he approaches Jesus and that of the Pharisees is that for the man, for the one who had been born blind, he was painfully aware of his need. While the others can't see beyond the human made self-righteousness they've created. And here's the reality. Until you know you're blind, you will never be able to see. And this is the great 
irony and really ultimately the tragedy of this text. The, the Pharisees were the ones who, who knew what Isaiah had written. They were the ones responsible to, to be on the lookout, to be observing, to, to have their eyes wide open, seeing, uh, looking for, waiting for the promise of hope that God had given to his people when the light would break into the darkness, when sin would be defeated when he would open the eyes of the blind and it's happening right in front of them and they can't see it because it's not what they were looking for. And as a result, instead of seeing Jesus as a healer, they view him as a threat. Instead of seeing Jesus as one who we should fall down and worship, they find ways, look for ways to silence him. And so here Jesus in this text, he confronts two kinds of, blight, of, of blindness. And yet at the conclusion of this, we're reminded again of the gift of sight. The gift of sight. Look again in verse 24 and 25 now. So they, they bring this man back. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And look at, look at his answer here. He says, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. He, he understands and he answers this question about who Jesus is. He has this clarity of sight that he's been given. This is the emotional center of this text, this man's statement in, in verse 25. And again, like, like Peter last week when Jesus asked the disciples, are you gonna leave me too? And Peter responds and said, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Right, right, we don't, we don't have all of this worked out, Jesus. We don't fully understand who you are. We don't have every question about you answered, but we've come to this conviction that you have the words of eternal life or in this man's testimony here, he says, one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. I know who I was before I met Jesus and I know who I am after I have been changed by Jesus and that tells me what I need to know about him. In fact, later in the text, Jesus finds this man again and, and, and he begins to ask him about his experience and who he is and this man, and, and again, this, this demonstration of, of faith just says, I believe and he falls down and worships him. Remember what we said at, at the outset of John's gospel, how John is telling the story of these miracles, not because these are the most impressive miracles that Jesus performed or they're the greatest display of, of his power per se, but because of the way in which they reveal the person and the purpose of Jesus the way in which he meets this physical need in order to reveal his ability and willingness to heal a spiritual one. As we continue to work our way through John's gospel together, our desire throughout this, this time is that we would encounter the real Jesus through the things that he says about himself that we would understand the invitation that he speaks to meet the one who is the light of the world, who was there at creation, who spoke it into being, and who has come to reveal himself as the one who is restoring us back to the very thing that we were created for, to be set into a right relationship with him. And so I, wanna, I just wanna, as we wrap up this morning, I just wanna, suggest three possible responses to this text this morning. One is if, if you are here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, meaning that, 
that you've never come to the belief that Jesus is the one who supplies the answer and the grace and the forgiveness of our, our human condition of brokenness. I want to invite you into that place this morning. I want to invite you right, right where you're at in your seat to, to follow the response of the example of the man whose eyes were made wide open and to say in your own heart and mind, I believe and I will worship you. You hear us talk sometimes at Chapel Street all the time about, about the gospel. And that is the core of what we believe, that this is who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And I want to invite you to put your faith in him. If you ever have questions about that, you can, you can find myself, you can find one of our prayer team or one of the other staff here at Chapel Street. We'd love to talk to you about that. But here when this, we see this response, this invitation to believe, Right, it's more than just a mental ascent. It's saying, I am placing the hope of my life in the person of Jesus, that he is the one who is able to account for my sin. I'm betting my life on him. Secondly, I think one of the responses that the text invites us into, and, and many of you here this morning may have been in a place where you have made that decision, you've placed your faith in Jesus, and yet we can still and there's something very human about this. We can revert back to that, that kind of self-righteousness that, that we see on display here in the Pharisees. And I just want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal your blind spots. Where, where are the areas in your life that you're just not seeing? Where, where have you experienced a moment where somebody else encounters or experiences grace and you feel offended by it? I think Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they want to confront that in us. They want to open the eyes of our heart that we may see him. And then thirdly, I want to just encourage you to bear witness. Back in the day here at Chapel Street, we, we did something called cardboard testimonies where people would take a piece of cardboard on the front side, they would write just a single statement or sometimes just a single word about who they were before Jesus, before they met Jesus. And on the flip side, they would write who they were after they had met Jesus. Here in this text, we see this beautiful depiction of a man bearing witness to the implications of, of, of meeting Jesus, where he says, I was blind, but now I see. Maybe this week, there's an opportunity for you at, at work, at school, with your friends or a neighbor, and, and, and maybe the simplest way possible to just bear witness to, to who you were before Jesus and who you are after him so that they too might know the one who opens the eyes of the blind. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for this time again, just to be in your word and, and to experience and to encounter who you are in your own words that you are the bread of life and that you are the light who has come into the world. Thank you for the thread of hope that Isaiah spoke hundreds of years before this passage and that it would be realized in you. Open our eyes that we may see. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning and... Um, and maybe even just in response to that text this morning, you have made a decision to place your faith in Jesus. And I wanna just invite you to come talk to me. I'd, I'd love to learn your name and, and meet you. And, um, or if, if you're not comfortable with that, our prayer team is available as well. We would love to meet you in that space. You can find them in the glass room out in the lobby. Um, and now receive this morning's benediction. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, who opens the eyes of the blind that we may see. And we ask all these things in his name. Amen.